good evening and thank you for joining us for famous way this is a very in conversation with grandmaster vishwanath anand he's taken a minute uh, so while he comes back for those of you who don't know this is not really a news conversation guys this is a treat uh, since we are all tracking the olympics we're talking about athletes we're talking about the challenges of following the sport in our country we just felt that let's take a break from the news let's do something fun instead this is that fun conversation that we bring to you we're in conversation uh, with india's grandmaster vishwanath anand so we're going to talk to him um, about everything uh, about his new book there's a biopic coming out we'll talk about we'll talk to him about how he got into chess um, all of those you know those championships that he's interestingly uh, shared a lot of you know sort of behind the scenes stories in his book which i found really interesting so that's something that you'd love reading as well uh the book interest uh, you know uh, wonderfully is is called mind master so take a look at it and there's also a biopic coming out but uh for those of you uh, who need reminding and i'm sure there are a few of you uh india's chess grandmaster five time world chess champion uh became grandmaster for the first time in 1988 which according to the book uh he was in this 12th standard hashtag no pressure right for the health of those of us who were just trying to sort of stay awake in math class at that point he was becoming grandmaster but um, what we're going to do also is sort of open this up to you guys who are joining us right now so ask whatever you want and i'll try and push those questions forward and um, you know that that should be fun and we are already getting questions so excellent um, mr vishwanath anand is back again after taking his break so thank you uh, for joining us um, mr anand you know i loved the book I love the idea that you sort of shared all of these anecdotes and sort of what was happening at the back end. I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions that uh, you know struck me. What I thought was very interesting was the influence that the two women in your life had on your entire chess career. So it's just your mom who plays this amazing role in the beginning, and then your wife who's part of every single thought and decision. It seemed like uh, towards uh, you know the, the the sort of effective end of your career. Do, would you would you take our audience through the role that your mother played and how you got into chess to begin with? Thank you. Uh, so I I was six when I learned how to play, and I learned it from my mother. <clears throat> Sounds like a simple sentence, but this is quite crucial because um, maybe thirty or forty years ago, ninety nine percent of people who wanted to play chess. looked for someone who could introduce them to the game didn't find one gave up and went away the game lost them so uh and it's it is quite unusual generally it tends to be your father your uncle your brother who teaches you the game i am already in a minority where my mother taught me how to play and uh, she came herself from a chess playing family so that uh, increases the increased chances i could uh, play chess and uh, she was heavily involved i mean till i was 17 18 she was accompanying me everywhere a um, couple of reasons probably to be helpful in you know when you're that young uh, they were not comfortable letting me travel but also at that point chess was a very adult world and uh, they must have thought okay i might fall into bad ways so better to accompany uh, but also to be uh, someone i could turn to for help so she was traveling with me everywhere um, and when i was 9 years old we were living in manila uh my father was posted there there was a daily chess program on tv um around 1 o'clock and i was still at school so she would write down everything that happened there and we'd play over it afterwards we'd solve the puzzles and send in our answers and i won a lot of chess books as prizes like that so you know i was and afterwards even when i was traveling alone and so on i my mother absolutely insisted i call her before and after every tournament let her know what's happening keep her posted and so on so we were very close and um yeah so no, you know the dedication and and this is i'm going to now skip between your life story what what the audience can learn from it and the odd question from the audience as well the dedication uh, uh, in the book is to your mother you said to my mom who told me to write down all my thoughts good or bad so that i could read them later and know how good they were uh and, and that's really you know really out of ordinary advice for a parent to give a child 
Is, is there more to that story? Um, it's actually principally about chess. So she told me, when you finish a game, write down everything that you thought about the game, um, because that you will forget very quickly afterwards. And, you know, afterwards you'll have, you'll invent a narrative and you'll think, well, that's what you, you'll invent a story, which is what you wish had happened, but you'll lose the real thing. And she said, well, uh, write down something uh, afterwards. But um, eventually I got into the habit of not only writing down what happened in the game and my thoughts before and after the game, but uh, into the habit of writing down what happened even off the chessboard. And that proved useful because then I'm, it happens to me a thousand times. I look at some old notes that I uh, put, but I really scream at myself, you know, it's an outlet as well. And, and you realize, oh my God, I'd forgotten all the tension. By now it's morphed into this beautiful memory. Everything went smoothly, but you read it and you realize, no, it was not like that while it was happening. Yes, you, you have talked about how you started noting down the, uh, you know, the hand gestures or the twitches that your, you know, your competitors uh, made during the match. And you said that if you left it for the next day, that it would just become docile. So is that some, is that advice that you would give young people in whatever it is that they're doing right now, write down everything? Yes, <clears throat> I would, I would say write down everything. Having said that, even I only managed to write down a fraction because you get lazy quickly and uh, you want to focus on the important stuff and there's things that get left out. But if you don't even do that, then afterwards it's very difficult to recall what happens. And the pleasure of writing down what really happened and surprising yourself some years later, that's, that's gold. Well, I'm going to take one audience question. Uh, Kajal Gart says, do you believe the chess should be part of the Olympics? or have a separate Olympiad, will that help boosting chess much more? Do you believe chess needs to be boosted, first of all, and do you think it should be part of the Olympics? Well, every sport has to continuously fight for its popularity. So yes, it, we, we need to keep on working on things. Uh, it would be good if it got into the Olympics, but we have our own chess Olympiad. Um, I think joining the bigger movement would certainly increase visibility. Do you believe that at least in India right now, there needs to be a bit more of a push? I know that you are also uh, at this point in the process of launching an academy uh, to encourage young players. Uh, even after these many years after you brought chess into the forefront in India, do you think it needs a bit of a push? Uh, I think you can never take your foot off the pedal. You know, you have to keep on selling the game because... Um, you know, you have to be out there, you have to continue, continuously reminding people and encouraging people to try it. And, uh, uh, you know, you want new people to come. Um, last year was a very good year for chess because thanks to the pandemic, a lot of our work got done for us. But, um, uh, you know, in, in all walks of life, you have to continuously sell your sport and uh, keep it relevant. Um, Tell us, tell us about the Westbridge Anand Chess Academy. What, what will it do and how can it help children who, you know, whose parents are maybe watching right now? Okay, so the nice thing is I went to Bangalore to uh, give a talk at, uh, for Westbridge back uh, in Feb 2019. And um, Sandeep mentioned to me, why don't we uh, do something with the... Uh, you know, would you like us to support and what can we do? And we did. Then one of the ideas I came up with was this uh, academy. And then um, we were working on it. We were going to announce it, the pandemic, pandemic struck. And a few months later, I just asked him if he was still keen. He said yes. And so in December last year, we were able to announce it and it launched as of January this year. The idea of the Westbridge Anand the Chess Academy, so Waka, and uh, the, the, the talent we hire, you know, we take uh, are called fellows. So we give them a fellowship. And the idea is to take some of our promising juniors and just give them a lot of support. Um, we will, and the idea is that I then become like a mentor or guide to them for the next few years, you know, uh, not only how to train, how to play chess, uh, how to get better and arranging coaches, but also sharing my experience, my journey, and hopefully they can pick up something from that as well. And um, they were already all very promising players. So these are the best juniors I picked. Um, they were all grandmasters. 
under the age of 16, all of them. And, um, uh, you know, I took Vaishali, uh, one of our most promising girls. And that's how we, we started. Then a little bit later, uh, Mendonka became a very young GM. He finished his title and he joined in. And so uh, the idea is just to be there with them and uh, accompany them, you know, guide them at this moment. I don't, we don't want them to waste time um, uh, looking for guidance, looking for stuff, looking for help. Uh, we'll try to cut all that out for them, support them. And uh, hopefully uh, in a few years, they'll all be in the top 10 together. And that'll be wonderful for me. Well, you talked about the influence your mother had on your career. Uh, the other woman, obviously, who's had a massive influence is your wife. You, you talk about in the book about how she did some of your negotiations, how she was the one to give you pep talks before, uh, you know, big matches. She rode with you to the venues. Um, tell us what sort of an influence she has, a role that, that she has played in your career. Well, when we got married, obviously, chess was a slightly alien world to her. But um, eventually, in fact, our honeymoon was at a chess tournament because I already committed to the chess tournament and we had to uh, go right away. So a couple of days after our wedding, we flew to Germany, Dortmund, and we went to play this tournament. And uh, I think about a year into our marriage, she suddenly said, well, look, I, you know, I, she used to work in advertising. And she said, well, why don't you let me uh, do some of your stuff for you? I mean, I can handle your... Uh, your media relations, your public relations and so on. And we can uh, uh, start working together. And then this evolved. She slowly started managing just about everything. Um, and this was a big, big help for me. In a way, similar to what I mentioned for the academy, which is that the more you can focus on chess and the less you uh, try to deal with practical matters on your own that you're not terribly good at, uh, it frees you. And so this is what the effect uh, it had. And also the fact that we were married meant that we could trust each other and uh, uh, confide in each other a lot. I think about three years in, she was already doing most of my contract negotiations because my attention span for these things is very low. Uh, I mean, I'll read the top two lines of the contract and get to the point and blitz through it. And, you know, I want to move on. Uh, which you can imagine is not very helpful when you're reading a contract. So that sort of thing. And um, uh, she started taking care of um, plane tickets, hotels, arrangement, everything. So that I had the luxury even a couple of um, weeks before uh, event, just to be able to get into my zone and not get out of it, a bubble almost. Um, I'm, I probably left out a lot. You can imagine her role is much more complete than this. She was a sounding board. She was a person I could take out my emotions on and so on. But um, I think this mixture of wife and manager, I yeah. put it in a funny way. So, <laughs> And That's obviously wonderful. very close companion, yeah. Uh, we have Pooja Kapoor who says, my five-year-old daughter likes to play chess mm -hmm. and she watches all of Vishwanathan's videos on YouTube and she's listening right now. That's wonderful, Pooja. Give her a hug for us. Uh, Karvik Student says, coming from a non-chess playing country and a middle-class family, apart from your parents, who played a significant role in your rise to the top and what were your major sources of improvement? Um, I was lucky. You're, she's completely right. My uh, India was uh, not a chess playing country in those days, but I was uh, lucky to be born in Chennai, which was uh, probably the most active chess playing city in the country. We had, and we had the spectacular club called the Michael Tal Chess Club in the Soviet Cultural Center. The top four players of the country were regular members. Good players. I mean, the best you could find in India would walk in and out and we would just sit there and play. There was no formal structure. None, there was nothing. Uh, the concept of coaching hadn't even entered. Uh, and, you know, you just played for fun. The good thing is I had no pressure to deal with. Almost everything I did, I was doing for the first time in, in, for an Indian and so on. So uh, there was no pressure. On the other hand, there are lots of stuff I had to learn on my own. So, you know, that's the trade-off. But um, it was a good group to play a lot of chess. And I believe that uh, especially our habit of just playing games, just playing five minute games the whole day, trying to get in as many games as possible, 
uh, helped make me a lot stronger without even realizing it. Because you keep on playing, you're getting better, and you don't realize until one day some critical mass you hit, and you play much better. So uh, I, I was lucky. I mean, I had uh, a lot of fun playing all these tournaments, and um, you, you I said my to- mother would take me to these junior and sub junior events and national events, traveling all around the country, even accompanying me abroad. Uh, my father would come once in a while, but mostly it was my mom, and uh, there was a very supportive chess community. You have talked about how, and this is really important for uh, other sort of uh, salaried middle class families. You talked about how your parents didn't sort of force academics on you. They didn't mandate that you need to be studying for these many hours or playing chess for these many hours. Uh, you know, they started you off on tennis, and then you dropped out of it because you just didn't feel it was giving you enough. So, is that was, was did that play a large role? The fact that your parents sort of gave you that freedom at that age to figure out what you wanted to do with your time. It was huge. I didn't. Re- I didn't even realize I appreciated them. But over time, you realize you meet so many people who say, you know, I really I was very excited about swimming or chess or badminton or whatever. But my dad wanted me to become, or my parents wanted me to become this, and that's why I became that. That sort of story you heard enough, and then I, I realized I was very lucky. Um, I never had uh, this conversation with my parents, so they. I suspect they were worried. They, they, I mean, they must have been. They could not have known what chess was like, but they understood that I loved it and they left, they left it at that. And that's big. Of course, later on when I asked them, they pretended, oh, no, we knew it all along. And <laughs> we couldn't have this frank conversation, but they must have, um, they must have been worried that you can't have, um, you know, a financially stable career with chess and, you know, what is this thing? So it was very helpful for me that I, I knew that they had, I, I, they had my back. I, could, uh, I didn't have to worry about them. School, I had episodes. There were some uh, uh, people in school who were not happy that I was playing chess, but they came around. And once I, I got into the papers and all, then they became very supportive. So already by the second year, uh, I, I was getting a lot of uh, support from school. And that also makes you feel good. I think when you're in your teens and all, you, do, you don't want to be this rebel fighting some cause. You, you want, people, you want pe- to know that people are behind you. And that's very important. Well, um, you, you did, of course, finish your graduation. Even though you were grandmaster when you were in the 12th standard, you did finish your graduation. So there was some voice in the back of your head that was telling you to continue academics or continue studying before you took up chess full time. Right? How did that play out? It was less meaningful than it sounds. I, by the time I was in the 12th, I think I had realized, and some wise person said this about chess. There is a, uh, you don't choose to play chess. You just choose not to do something else. Uh, once you've got the bug, you got the bug. You, you can't, you, like many things, you know, chess just gets into your blood. But um, if, when I finished 12th standard and I became a world junior champion and grandmaster, if you had asked me to, have I given any serious thought to any other career? Of course I hadn't, but I decided to go through the motions. It felt like some sort of insurance policy. I, I had this feeling that it was healthy to go to college anyway. That is some social interaction. You, um, you do get to study a bit. And I, I didn't think that dropping out at school was particularly glamorous. This was, this, this was Bill, before Bill Gates and all these guys, but anyway. So <laughs> I decided to do my BCom. And my BCom was this compromise where something which didn't have practicals and require a lot of um, time commitments so I could study even wherever I was and uh, somehow pass it. But at the same time, it, it, if I, the unlikely event, I decided to stop uh, chess, then at least those three years hadn't been wasted. Looking back, I cannot imagine a scenario where I've done something else. So I don't know who I was kidding, but it seemed like a fun thing to do. And I don't think it distracted me. You can't you can't work on something all the time. And so it's nice to do something else. Even if I had not done my BCom, I don't think I'd have spent the whole day analyzing chess. Well, we have a question from Shiva uh, Krishnan Anand who says, please ask him whether his natural skill or hard work contributed more to his success. I, I would say you don't get anywhere without hard work, but my natural skill ensured that most of my hard work didn't go to waste. Um, clearly 
you can see that chess players have different level of talent. I mean, some people are just talented to play the game. You can, there's some sort of connection and others have to work harder to get the same results, but they may be talented in something else. Um, and that's the trade-off. I was lucky that um, most of the work I did in chess, I didn't have to do too often. And um, I progressed quite fast in, in various critical moments in my career. But you don't get anywhere in life without hard work. Not hard work. Uh, to our audience, please use the Super Chat feature as well. We have one person who said, can you please start a chess academy? Arey Raj Kumar, abhi abhi to bola tha. Take a look at Westbridge Anand Chess Academy online. We've already put a little brief a little earlier in the video. You can look at that. There is a chess academy. Please ask him how he became so mentally strong and how he managed to handle the pressure. This is a question from Vinay. And it's interesting because you talk a lot about that in the book. And I thought that was fascinating because um, also back when you were winning all of these accolades, very little of it would be covered in the newspaper, right? It would just say, this is what has happened. We didn't know what you were really going through, how young you were at that time. How did you handle, handle the pressure, the loss, the wins, all of it? Um, I struggled and I still do. Part of the, uh, one of the things about sport is that you never figure out a way to be mentally strong. You figure out how to cope and you manage. Uh, some days you get the formula right, other days uh, it's not enough and then you try to get a bit better, you push yourself. Um, I have found that it's very hard to control what's in your head, but I can keep on changing the environment and make it slightly easier for me. One of the things I mentioned in the book is there are certain things I will do badly all my life because that's how I am. I am. And perhaps it's even a counterpoint to the things I do well that you excel at one area and you're bad at the other. But um, if you can identify what goes wrong and then work at it at home so that there is less problem solving happening at the board, more of uh, taking a, a solution that you had ready and applying it in the areas that you're weak, then it frees you to focus on your strengths. Um, so mostly you cope, you continuously keep evalu evaluating yourself. You have to be honest, brutally honest with yourself. Again, why my mother's advice was good. It's only when you write down what you're actually thinking, you remember what, uh, well, you, you have an honest answer. Um, and then you cope, you basically cope. I still do. So, okay, if I were to extrapolate and tell me if I'm pulling this too far, this is, some, this is advice perhaps all of us can use in all our careers, right? Which is basically um, self-assessment, honest self-assessment constant self-improvement where you, you know, you're, you're saying, okay, this is what I did wrong. This is how I make sure that it doesn't happen again. This is what I learned from the situation. And then you apply that in any situation that comes up. Uh, okay, that was basically how you handled all of your losses. Is that true? They were all learning opportunities? Yes. I mean, after you've thrown your key at the bed and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> Once That's very mild. The throwing your key on the bed is a really mild way to react. Uh, well, tennis hotel, players hotel. smash their rackets. <laughs> I, yeah, that is very nice, but uh, throwing your key at a glass window might uh, bring a fine. So I think the bed is as good as it gets. But uh, I mean, there is some tongue gnashing, and it's you. You you have sleepless nights. It takes you a day to recover. You hate yourself. Some. Some games stay in your memory for years and haunt you for years. You can still wake up many years later and think, oh God, uh, I, I was there briefly. But, um, but yes, self-assessment. Also, one of the things I mentioned is um, how people think because you're good at chess, you must be awesome at concentration. And um, the answer is no. I'm, I concentrate effortlessly on things that fascinate me and I, I cannot concentrate at all on things that don't interest me. What's, what do I do in, uh, in chess? If there's something which bores me to death in chess, I try to reduce it to a few steps that maybe I do find interesting and see if I get into this unpleasant situation in the board, uh, let me look for certain things that I can do better, that I can watch my opponent do, something, some sort of hook that you can focus on, and then your concentration comes naturally. But can I tell my mind, now I'm going to concentrate and do I magically concentrate? No, that doesn't happen. So. I want to read out a couple of uh, really sweet messages that are coming in for you. This one is from Dips, who says, Thank you, dear Vishi, sir, for all the wonderful achievements that you've had in your glorious career. 
not just Sachin Centuries, but also Anand versus Kasparov inspired millions growing up. You are a true legend. Uh, that's really sweet. Thank you for writing that out. Uh, so there's a lot of you, you know people calling you the pride of the uh, of the country, which is which is nice. Uh, lots of very complimentary messages. Please ask Vishi, uh, please answer the, why even after 30 years, other than him, not a single Indian has made it to the top 10. Where are we lacking? There, there are a couple of them who are very close, like Hari Krishna got us into the top 20 and is holding the top 20. Uh, Vedith is just outside. And I believe that many of uh, our players are just a little bit away. Um, and hopefully, I mean, there's a lot of circumstances. The current chess environment is very, very competitive. Um, and hopefully with the Westbridge Academy, we will not have any shortage of top 10 players in about four or five years. How, how do uh, young chess players apply to the academy? It's not a. It's not an application. Obviously, I I pick them, and okay. I I you know I, I identify the ones who are really strong. I think who have a lot of potential, and also young, so that we still have time to work together. Um, and um, that's why all of them are in their teams, um, and you know I pick them. So I'm continuously keeping an eye out for juniors. Um, in fact, there are a lot of very promising juniors, but you know the program shouldn't balloon not too big, so I, I've tried to be selective, but there are a lot of people who I think uh, just missed the thing, and I'm, you know, I'm keeping an eye out, and if somebody develops and develops quickly, I'll put out a feeler and ask if they want to join. Uh, but it, we, you know, we pick them, and because I have uh, the backing, I don't need to, uh, I mean, obviously we don't charge them anything and so on. So it's not, it's not that kind of academy, it's more of a, a scholarship, a fellowship, that kind of I'm going to read out a sentence from the book, uh, which is advice that somebody else gave you, which I thought was really interesting. And I'd love for you to share the story behind this. It says, um, it always makes sense to keep working at goals without obsessing over how far you are from it or how hopelessly you've been missing the mark each time. If you persevere, it will eventually be yours. Um. I think you can improve at something without being perfect at it. And there are many, many areas where uh, just because you can't do it as well as you may want to, you shouldn't stop trying to improve at all. It's still worth putting in a little bit of time, trying to do a little bit better. And over time, these little increments add up. And one day you're much better than you thought you could get. Maybe still not perfect, but you get much better. Um, and the other thing is simply the, the you shouldn't put too much pressure on yourself you should give yourself the time and let the process of improvement be, be enjoyable um, i mean most careers you hope will be quite long and then you don't want to you don't want to get into the sprint you want to pace it well is, is that hindsight though because you do talk about this one incident when you were when you said i hate chess after a, after a loss so in the moment, is it difficult to remember that you shouldn't put too much pressure on yourself? You put pressure on yourself continuously. And it's in, maybe it's because I put pressure, I realize this is very good advice. Uh, but again, it's because you put pressure on yourself that you have to find ways to, uh, you have to develop habits that allow you, to, uh, allow it to dissipate. Because it's not happening naturally. One of the things about playing a practical game is you can give yourself instructions when, when you're sitting at home and say, I'm going to do this better, I'm going to do that better. These instructions can be technically perfect. But there, when you're tense, you're irritable, you're uh, unable to focus, you cannot follow even the instructions. You may remember them perfectly, but you cannot apply them. Your, your nerves are too wound up. But once you've experienced that, then you understand, wait, once I get over there, I, I lose control. So what are the things I can do to... One of the uh, things I discovered that when you finish the first time control, getting up and going and sitting in the uh, player's room for five minutes, even letting your clock run, you just sit there for five minutes and then you come back. Cools you down a little bit, maybe not per perfectly, but it cools you down enough that you can think again a bit calmly. Um, 
if it's important to put aside past failures and focus on the future imagine how much more important it is to forget the first part of the game and focus on the game now because the point is still not lost been lost you can still try uh so these are the kinds of things i do to cope because i know that on all autopilot it won't happen so how do you uh, find some way to implement it there's a question from gosh gorish manekar who says do you think any of our current players are could actually turn out to be as good as bobby fisher in your opinion was fisher the best player ever look i love uh, bobby fisher and i've always thought he's uh, the best player ever um but you also realize that it's very hard to compare circumstances part of the the romanticism of bobby fisher is that he lived in a country where he was so fanatical about the game that no one else was interested in and so there was this very na- small group of people he could turn to and he single handedly came up against this soviet chess machine um other rating performances or technical performances that are superior to his yes uh, but if you take the package as a story i still like his story but it's apples and oranges you cannot even compare my journey to his you cannot compare um, many of the soviet players also went through great hardships mm. you eventually you realize that uh, it's just very difficult to compare people the circumstances change the times change now we are in times when we just soaked in technology and uh, it takes quite some effort to even visualize how people did things before well, we have a really fascinating question from satri tripathi who says as a chess hobbyist is there any way that i can use the game to improve my day to day life or is that too much to ask from a game it's too much to ask for a, from a game uh but if you try to get a little bit better at chess what will happen is that you'll learn how you're improving you know what are the things that you're doing to improve and eventually you'll suddenly in some other part of your life you'll suddenly have this eureka moment and you'll think ah i can do the same thing here so you know playing chess regularly does develop train certain habits which are good for you but um, it's not so linear you cannot say i'm going to play chess because then i'm going to do better in studies it is not like that but over time you'll realize you're building habits that are making you stronger well someone asked this interesting question that basically during the pandemic more people playing chess more than ever which is what you said as well there's a lot of online chess tournaments right now um do you see that as pushing chess forward what's the difference really between the do you, do you see the online chess tournaments as a good thing or how is it different from you know in person physical dominance um i think it's a fantastic thing the thing is the main thing is chess grew last year which means more pe- people who never played chess or had uh, forgotten chess for many years came back to the game that's an unqualified good but um going forward we should try to use these new uh, formats these new uh, time controls and so on without giving up what we used to like about chess as well so the ratio of uh, events will change but you should keep uh, all the aspects that you like um i think over the board chess is very pleasurable at least as a player i found it fantastic to play uh, in croatia and then in germany as i did in july and uh, you know I, i felt fantastic after a year of uh, sitting and uh, doing stuff online but um it it's growing the game and that's wonderful all these people who come to the game then they try to get better they want competitions and it benefits everyone so uh it's just unqualified good i, I don't think there's anything to take away from it well uh, there are some funny guys who are asking about ludo and snakes and ladders but i want to turn that question around and ask you this for those people who are now adults who never got a chance to learn the game when they were children or when they were young people can they still learn very much you can learn at any age and you can um, get better you can improve you can make progress once again it comes to enjoying what you do and getting better at it and getting enjoyment from get, getting better at it i promise you if you play a game and today somebody shows you a trick and tomorrow you can trick someone you'll go away uh on cloud 9 because the joy of beating someone is always there in chess 
it doesn't mean that you have to become a grandmaster you have to become world champion that's not the point but um, it's only the pleasure of learning something new and uh, and seeing yourself improve it if you can crack that then it's fun so and you'll you'll probably get much better than you thought possible at the beginning a uh, bg who hasn't given us his name asks does playing chess make the average joe smarter and you dealt with this in your book where you you talked about a little bit you said if you are good at chess people assume that you have an idiot memory that you can remember everything that you're smarter than everybody else uh you found that to be true in some cases and not true in in all cases so one are all chess players smarter than everybody else or does chess make you smarter than everybody else like most activities chess trains your brain in a certain way there are some things you get better at you get better at um Uh, problems again chess is a, a special kind of game where uh, we have perfect information everything which is on the chess board is uh, available to both uh, players there can be nothing hidden um and so on so this is a specific kind of game you learn certain special skills that then work well typically in academics in finance many chess players have gone on to do well in these kinds of fields um and you get better at learning and so on equally i wouldn't say that it necessarily makes improves your social skills because it doesn't train that um in fact more often than not chess players are uh, quite introverted uh or they become very extroverted only in very com- uh, only amongst friends and so on so it's a balance you can uh, there are some things that you improve with chess Well, there's a there's a fun question here, and again, you've talked about sort of slowing yourself down during your matches and during your moves a lot on purpose. Gaurav Pai says there was one game where you took one minute and forty three seconds to make your fourth move, and you eventually won that game. What was going through your mind during that one minute and forty three seconds? I I still cannot explain what was going on. Why I was dreaming like that, but. some days your head is just not there and i was just dreaming i i was not almost groggy because i suddenly could not remember what i was supposed to play there was some line kept popping into my head and i thought how do i make that line work and there was nothing unusual about thinking for a minute and a half but it's insane what i did because only 5 minutes for the game in total so <laughs> using 40% of your time on the fourth move was nuts um <clears throat> i think it was still good because i knew that if i remember that then i could get to move 20 without any further thought because everything had worked out so all i needed to do is remember some fundamental question at the beginning but like i said i, I was feeling very confused and uh, i invested the time i think on balance it was a wise decision but uh, it's not going to pay off every time uh, because with 3 minutes against 6 minutes you're handicapped in the special case i had the opening worked out and it compensated Well, uh, I don't have too much time, so I am going to ask you this question for someone who was that successful at the age of eighteen. Um, and you did talk about how, after you became grandmaster, you felt a little weakened because you didn't know what came next, and you put all your energies into this one thing. Um, how did you manage, though, to sort of stay grounded and you know not let the arrogance, the success, you know, sort of get into your head? A fairly young person. Um, you know it it was an amazing amazing achievement what did you do to sort of keep your feet on the ground um again i certainly enjoyed uh, the fame and uh, the attention and so on but uh, i tried to be normal it also helps what people around you how they treat you if they treat you normally then uh, you remember to keep acting normal so you know with my family i knew that things would not change and with my school friends as well things would not change and uh, uh you know with my chess friends things wouldn't change and then and the other thing is um i think i'm good at behaving in public also uh, you could ask why i am so well behaved at the chess board and i'm it has nothing to do with being well behaved i just know how to uh, act well at the board <laughs> so there's a bit of that as well uh there is a biopic coming out which is which is you know which is going to be made tell us what the status is of that and what does that feel like to you know someone's making a film about your life are you nervous about how they'll handle the story um i am very curious which is another way of saying nervous maybe um 
in a sense, it feels like the next step. For me, after a long time, I came around to doing this uh, autobiography in a, a serious way. And then, um, you know, the book happened and it was a new experience because I wrote the book at a time when I was able to share a lot and uh, it felt very nice to be able to address these things. It felt like something, yeah, you can do once and it's, uh, it's a nice new experience. And I think the biotech will be the audiovisual version of that. But um, I, am, I am curious. I'm also nervous because um, not, I, I find it strange to watch uh, my, I mean, here, watch my own interviews, I hear my own voice and so on. So this is going to be one level higher. Watching someone else uh, imitate you it might be even more to watch. <laughs> Dhanush is playing you apparently from what we understand. That isn't, we haven't gotten that far yet, but um, if if it is Danush, then at least uh, I've sold one ticket already, my son, because uh, <laughs> his, he, when he was very young, you know, we had Colavari and um, uh, Donna, 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 and so on, a couple of his songs, and Ak- Akil remembers those songs very fondly. So at least there's one ticket we have sold. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a couple of more questions for you. If you'd give us five more minutes, I'll take uh, a few more questions that have come okay. in. Um, Garish asks again, towards the end of their lives, Morphe and Fisher hated chess viscerally. Given that nothing is impossible, do you think you'll ever reach that stage? I hope not. I hope uh, I have uh, enough balance to uh, stop. Bobby was an extreme case, Bobby Fisher. Paul Morphe, I simply don't know because he was 170 years ago. But uh, it's the same thing. I think there's an emptiness. What I mentioned after the Grandmaster title, that suddenly a goal which looms so large is you're accomplished and you don't know what to do next. But for them, they didn't know what to do next after chess. Uh, And I hope people, you know, that we have learned from their experience as well, that uh, chess is only a part of your life and you've got to let it, you, you let it go. And when... You're not able to uh, perform at the same level or do it at the same level, then you enjoy the other good things in life. I mean, uh, yeah. we, we all have a short time and you should uh, try and enjoy things as well. So hopefully I can find that balance. Suraj asks, how has age affected your ability to play chess? How is it you're still managing to play extremely high quality chess at the top level? And how long do you think you can keep playing? Thank you. Um, it's a process of continuous correction. I have to correct for certain things in the same way that um, you keep, you change your glasses every few years. You have to correct a little bit every time. I I know that I'll make more mistakes in calculation and uh, either I make different decisions going into the board and then therefore my preparation becomes slightly different or uh, I give myself some leeway to adjust or simply you anticipate things will go more wrong go wrong more often, how am I going to deal with the board? Uh, You compensate a little bit, but then you keep working. You still keep pushing yourself and you should keep pushing yourself because you're fascinated by chess. Uh, And then, well, we'll see, but uh, July was a very good month for me. Um, I had very good results and uh, already then your confidence comes back and you feel good. Um, But this is kind of extra time. You should enjoy it. As long as it goes well, I'll enjoy it. Well, you've talked about what your parents were like. Is there, um, is there some advice you'd give parents who are watching this video on what to do if they have a child who has a particular interest in chess or any other game? I'm kind of in the same boat myself. My son is 10 years old. And so it's a question I'm going to face or already faced a couple of times. Um, and our answer both uh, Aruna and me is give them every chance to explore every area they might be interested in, but uh, beyond that, it has to come from them. And you feel this very strongly from inside because you yourself know that you made a very strong decision towards chess, so you can translate that and say, uh, it really has to be something that excites them. You you feel strongly that outsiders can't motivate you. You have It has to come from within, and then well, what are your try to stay away. What are your son's interests right now? He plays chess, he, but he dabbles in lots of things. He does some coding. He's a very good dancer. Not me, not me. <laughs> He's a very good dancer. Uh, he paints extremely well. Um, and 
is at the moment uh, completely addicted to the blue planet so i don't know i don't know where he's going but uh, i'm serious so, so you're not you're says. not giving him dancing tips there no <laughs> <laughs> you have never seen me dance <laughs> never no, seen but he, he does it seriously he, he takes all these really uh, catchy songs and uh, does it. in fact he's been a window into modern spanish music uh, reggaeton especially which is very popular because somehow he picked it up and uh, we i have no idea where from All right. We have run out of time, but thank you so much, Vishwanath and Anand, for giving us time answering all of our questions. Uh, very, very good luck to the Academy. It sounds fantastic, and it sounds like it has a really clear uh, sort of purpose, and that's always nice to come across. Uh, to our audience, check out the book. When the biopic does come out, check it out as well. Thank you so much for watching. For everybody else, the news will be up at exactly nine o'clock, where we give you only the information. There's no opinion that there's no and there's no noise. Do check that out as well. Share this video with anyone you think would be interested who might have missed it. Thank you for watching. Thank you.